How's it going, everybody? I'm Ryan. He's Abby. We are the Expansion Bros, and we're excited to start another week of hockey talk for your Buffalo Sabres and your Vancouver Canucks. And this is a week where both of our teams have gone streaking. Uh, and it's a complete 180 <laughs> for me. Uh, and you are feeling sort of like I did at the start of last episode. So how are things over in Vancouver right now? You guys, you guys getting worried? What are, what what's the vibes? Tell you what, I am very glass half full. I think this team has earned that mentality from the fans. You know, sometimes if you're if you're in first place in the league, I think that gives you just a little bit of rope, a little bit of leeway. Um, now, I was not feeling that way until the Boston game. So, as we were last talking, the Canucks were in a crazy game with the Wild back and forth. Um, and uh, since then, they've gone one and two, losing to. Um, Losing to a couple teams and beating the Bruins all. Sorry, let me just pull it up. Yeah, you it up, lost to Colorado up. and Seattle. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Seattle loss yeah. marked four losses in a row before that Boston yeah. overtime win snapped the streak. So very could easily been five games without a win. Yeah, so that Colorado game was our first time this season losing three in a row, making us the last team to do so um, in terms of every other team had lost three in a row at some point over the season. Uh, so that was a nice thing while it lasted, but... Uh, uh, honestly, that's very, very rare. You can go throughout a season without a three-game losing streak. You know, it's just that's just how hockey is. You know, it's a game of bounces, and no matter how good you are or how lucky you are, uh, based based on the PDO merchants. Well, whichever uh, event, way the puck bounces. Will turn. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, it's just, it's just impractical to imagine us going throughout the whole season like that. Um, but what I will say is outside of the Seattle game where we were bullied physically and we were outplayed, I would say the Canucks have been playing some pretty solid hockey um, and just getting a little unlucky is all. Uh, and and we, we talked about this earlier. Sorry. Uh, the underlying mm -hmm. stats back that up over the last, you know, five games, you guys are playing very, very well outside of the uh, Seattle game, as you mentioned, right? So Winnipeg, mm -hmm. Minnesota, Colorado, and, uh, and Boston, you guys had over 55% of the shot attempts. Um, you guys surprisingly actually generated uh, more than 50% of the expected goals in three of those five too. So not only were you guys putting shots, sure, taking shot attempts, but they were also quality shots as well. So uh, like you said, unlucky um is definitely the word you want to use here. You know, over this over this uh, five game stretch where you guys went one and four, your PDO was a ninety four. So for a fan base mm. that's used to one oh five, just chilling in that land, ninety four mm -hmm. is gonna feel like there's just nothing's going in that you're getting unlucky at every turn. But but that's the thing, like mm -hmm. the underlying and and you said the eye test matches it that you guys are still still playing well. So this was bound to happen. Yeah, and like I said, the one game where we did not play well was against the Kraken, and I think uh, this game really showed the Canucks' resiliency, and again, this is a game last year the Canucks lose 100% of the time. We can go over briefly the Avalanche game again. The Canucks were up 1-0 in the first, and the Avalanche ended up tying it in the second and then taking it in the third. Uh, Port Moody, uh, BC native Ryan Johansson scoring two goals. Again, not much you can really be mad at over the Canucks' effort. Obviously, they didn't score, but... Uh, you know, they were putting shots on the net. You know, 25 shots is not a ton, but uh, they were dominating the play. Uh, that's all you can ask. Um, yeah, and I mean, then against it, the Kraken, that was the game that it was. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, you were you were mentioning that Colorado game. You guys only had only had 25, right? Shots on goal. Uh, but as mm -hmm. far as shot attempts, you guys had 57% of the shot attempts too. So it was just one of those yeah. games where... There weren't a lot of shot attempts. Maybe it was a game clogged in the neutral zone. I didn't watch too much. Maybe it was a game where, you know, suppression to the outside, whatever. But, you know, th those those games happen um, for you guys to have this string of them after being shelled by Minnesota. So funny story, actually. Yeah, I remember mm -hmm. we were talking about that last week and you were mentioning that Casey to Smith, like they got to pull him. They got to pull him. Why aren't they pulling him? Like, why is he still in there? My fantasy yeah. hockey opponent started Casey to Smith. For that game so that was really good for me i did end up losing by like one and a half points but casey to smith did his best to keep me in that matchup so i appreciate talk it leaving him in there that's that's that canucks sabers connection we got you bro we got you but, but yeah um that cracking game again that was kind of the exception where the canucks really genuinely deserved to lose 
Um, but one thing I will mention, a goal scorer in both the Kraken game and uh, the Avalanche game, JT Miller is the most consistent Canuck. Maybe Quinn Hughes, but at least on forwards for sure, JT Miller is the most consistent Canuck. You can set your watch to him. He feels like he gets a point every single game, or if he isn't, he's giving the other team hell, and he's really showing his true leadership. Um, we'll get into it in the Boston game. I, I've really been enjoying, there's a couple different channels. I think one of them is like Glovey McLovin or something like that. Um, and it shows like the post game interviews of Miller and Zadorov and Talkin and whoever. Right. And I feel like Miller always has the right mentality. And, you know, like we saw last year, right. Miller can be a hothead sometimes. And it feels like he's really cooled it down this year. He's still passionate. But he's been able to kind of calm the bench, as Talkit talked about. Uh, Miller's been able to inspire the boys on the bench. And uh, in the Boston game, Miller was driving that game. Miller deserves the MVP. Yes, Besser scored two goals. Yes, Demko was good. Yes, Zadorov was good. But Miller was the one who drew up the play that for the 2-1 goal. Miller was the one who put it on net for Besser to tip uh, on the game-winning goal. That was a win through the sheer will of JT Miller. And... Every day, that JT Miller contract looks better and better and better, much to the relief of myself and many other Canuck fans. Oh, yeah. It, it, I mean, when you have 79 points, uh, 29 goals in 60 games played, like you're probably yeah. going to be looked at as very <laughs> consistent. Uh, but, you know, you mentioned, you know, the Seattle game and the Boston game is two examples of, you know, ones where he kind of puts the team on his shoulders and, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. He had the highest expected goals, individual expected goals of any player. Actually, only two players had above 0.1 expected goals against Seattle. It was Nils Hoglander at 0.24. And then it was uh, uh, JT Miller at 0.54. <laughs> so just the only guy that generated any significant quality shot. Uh, but then, then against Boston, you know, he's third on the team, right? Uh, behind Garland and Besser. But he's got 0.33, like a third of a goal, right? So in those two games... He's expected to score one. I, I think he did against Boston, but you know, it just goes to show you when those guys are constantly around the net. I mean, these the stats back it up that he is a leader. And was it against Seattle? I remember Tockett was calling out something about the compete level. Um, yeah. Was was that quote after that game? Because it got posted on the Sabres subreddit because they're like, I wish yes. our coach talked like this. And it's like he does, but you just it's different when you're winning. Yeah, no, that was after the crack game. And again, uh, after the Boston game, uh, I think Rocket, or Rockets, <laughs> Rick Tockett clarified um, that Miller wasn't really the person he was referring to. You know, throughout even throughout the three, four games where they were struggling, Miller was someone who kept his compete level high. And again, when you have someone like that leading the locker room, he also, I think, had eight hits against Boston. I clarify, he did not score. He got three assists, though. He assisted on every single goal that game. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So again, like I said, Miller was driving that game for the Canucks, but also leading the team in hits. When you see, like you like you said, 79 points in 60 games, and he's also throwing the body around, that inspires the rest of the team to follow him into battle. And they did against the Bruins. And I, I remember looking at the Canucks bench when Hronik scored that tying goal and seeing how excited they were. They were so happy. They were so pumped. It looked like it reminded me of my ball hockey days when we'd score. And we'd be like, yeah, 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 like patting each other on the helmets and stuff. Like it was, it, I, I was just so happy looking at it because I don't remember the last time I've seen a Canucks team like that. Yeah. Like that pumped for each other, that happy for each other, that invested. I have not seen that in who knows how long. Well, I think um, it goes to the culture built by Tockett. And, you know, maybe he's got his fingerprints all over JT Miller and his 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 personality shift like you mentioned he he had all the energy in the past maybe he didn't channel it the right way uh but now that under talk it you know the new change after, for the last season and a half year like that's exactly what you need you need guys that are going to bring energy but in the right way you can't have guys that are just going out there and playing reckless because they get frustrated like thanks you have energy but you need to keep it in check and especially as a leader you know, like you mentioned, eight hits in a game against a tough opponent who you guys aren't very fond of, I don't think. Um, and, <laughs> and, uh, I don't know. Maybe 10 years ago, 14 years ago. Actually, the last time uh, when you guys made the Stanley Cup was the last time the Sabres made the playoffs. So hopefully uh, you guys making the or I mean, the cup, I should say, hopefully you guys making the cup again signals good things for buffalo uh <laughs> but no like when you see your 79 point player the guy leading the team in points tied for second on the team in goals he's out there throwing the body against what is known to be a physical and tough to play against team i mean that 
Uh, you can't ignore that if you're, you know, at the at the you know bottom of the bench, right? I, I don't I don't want to call anybody out as a depth player, a fourth liner on yeah. you because I don't want to do injustice to guys like Nils Amon or or whoever was playing. But uh, I'm yeah, just yeah. looking I'm looking at points. He's got six, so he was my target. Uh, <laughs> Poor Amon uh, catching yeah, strays. I, I'm not saying. I'm just saying like he can't hide. There's not like you can't beat Nils Amon and be like, well, I'm just not going to do that. Like if J T Miller doing it you bet your ass you better be in there and doing the same darn thing and i think that yeah, trickle absolutely. down effect from the coach to a star player to the rest of the lineup is huge and channeling it the right way and not getting frustrated uh, we spoke about that earlier yeah. too like not getting in your own head over this four game stretch where your pdo is bad after you got shelled yeah, by minnesota uh you know you did score a lot but it, it, scoring seven just doesn't feel as good when you allow 10 I, again no, no, like doesn't. you score seven but allowing 10 just makes you feel like well we didn't we didn't we played awful right but you still scored yeah. seven still letting that get into your mindset and your approach to the game i think could really have derailed the canuck season in just a span of a week right maybe yeah. they start gripping too tight and then you know if it's it continues right you don't get that win against boston you don't put that effort in you don't you have that compete level that your coach is asking for and all of a sudden coach keeps calling out in the media and things get a little toxic and maybe we're talking about a pd trade in two weeks rather than an extension oh God. you know <laughs> no absolutely right it's, it's funny how like so many things just teeter on one little thing you know what if what if the puck had gone off the post or whatever i, sh I should give the canucks credit for this game it's a 3-2 game in overtime but to be very blunt the canucks were dominating the bruins i know the advanced stance wouldn't necessarily 100 percent back that up but the eye test says they dominated 50 minutes of this game um, the Bruins took the advantage of their chances and Swayman was brilliant. Like you mentioned, Besser and uh, uh, Garland were leading in um, expected goals. Garland was like grade A after grade A opportunity. Even Miller had a crazy slap shot and Swayman bang, out goes the glove. Like that's one of the heaviest slap shots I've seen that like genuinely could knock a goalie over and he made an incredible glove save. Um, so Again, as, as the scoreboard might be close, but the Canucks were dominating. It was Swayman uh, for the Bruins, and then just a little bit of luck uh, that actually even took it to overtime in the first place. Yeah, you guys um, had a full expected goal higher. Now that's a massive swing. You guys had about uh, the deserved win a meter, which kind of measures based on how many times you played that expected goal spread, right? Whatever, sixty nine percent chance to win that game, which is a very very nice winning percentage i mean that's really really good like come on i mean most games are within that the 60 to 60 doesn't quite hit 60 like 59 to 59 range right yeah, yeah. usually games are in there when you're starting to get into the 68 almost 70s i mean that's that you guys deserve to win that game and you did and i think it kind of points to vancouver season right the puck has gone in at the right time and yeah. you know you don't want to talk about like teams of destiny but you certainly are creating your own luck and you're finishing the chances you're yeah. given which is just you know it's a snowball effect we talked about the negative uh impact of hey maybe you miss those chances but when you make those chances all of a sudden you feel like you're gonna make the next one and you're gonna make the next one and when you make two out of three if you miss the next two you're like well i i know i can do it so you just get right back to it yeah, and I think that's what part of, like, you said, people talk about the Canucks' uh, inflated shooting percentage. Confidence is one of the main things that can create an inflated shooting percentage. If you're feeling confident, you're going to let it rip more, and you're going to score more goals, and that shooting percentage is going to go up, right? So we'll see if it's sustainable in the long term, like, next year and stuff, right? But if people stay confident, they can score goals. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up with this little skid here, the losing streak before the Boston game, is it made me think of Tampa Bay. Uh, if you can recall your head back to when they were swept as the President's Trophy uh, champions or the Never President's forget. Trophy winners against the Blue Jackets. Um, they did not face adversity all year. They were just sweet. I think they had 64 wins or something they like something crazy. They steamrolled the league. And we saw yeah, it with Boston it, last year. Yeah. yeah. Um, when you don't face adversity in the regular season, it tends to come back to bite you because adversity is where you find your weaknesses and you can work on them. I think this skid is actually very good for the Canucks. And I know I don't want to sound like I'm huffing on some copium, like, oh, thank God, they lost four games in a row. Woohoo. Right. But your adversity is how you figure out what your issues are and how to address them if they come up again. Uh, 
And I think it coming at this point in the season after they've got Lindholm, but potentially before any other acquisitions is actually the perfect time. So you can really acclimate the team into what they want to do. And if you make additions, you know exactly what the issues are so you can address those needs uh, at the deadline. So I, if there was a time for a skid, you'd never want a skid, right? But given the adversity example, now is basically the perfect time for a skid because they're still first in the league, maybe not as of the end of results today, but I'm pretty sure as at least as of last night, they were still first in the league for points. So I I, I think I'm still very, very optimistic for Vancouver. And honestly, uh, this skid may have just been for the best. Also yeah. for humbling us as well. We, we may need to take a little peg down <laughs> as Vancouver fans. <laughs> you guys have been just blazing Twitter over the last five months. It's honestly, I don't mind it because you guys don't play us more than twice a year. Uh, and if we do yeah. end up playing more than <laughs> twice a year, we're both very, very happy. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, but I know and enjoy it, right? Make the most of it. This is, this is what it is, right? Uh, you guys are still yeah. first as of this minute. I just searched it up. You guys are still first in the league uh, on fun. points. Um, and, but the one thing I would say, you know how you mentioned you find your weaknesses, your mm-hmm. power play has got to figure it out. The, the power play percentage has halved since the all-star break. You were set at a 24% clip heading into the all-star break. You come out of the break. You guys are at 12%. You've just failure to launch the power play as a power outage right now. Um, and you'd think that you didn't do much. You didn't get rid of players. You added Lindholm, but he can't be. It's not like Lindholm is blocking shots on the power play. Like what has, <laughs> what, what's going on? Have you noticed anything specific with the power play? Is it just a matter of being unlucky on the power play? Or is there like a schematic change where teams got a, a week to scout you and they figured something out? I'm sure part of it is teams like smartening up, but I also think it was, it was, this was an issue before we got Lindholm as well with Kuzmenko on that first power play. I think we tried a bunch of different players as that fifth man suitor. I think at this point they were planning on using Hironic there as well. And then maybe having Tyler Myers as the defenseman on that second power play, which I know sounds weird, but Myers is doing quite well offensively this year, especially by Tyler Myers standards. Um, it's Calder trophy winner, Tyler Myers to you. <laughs> That's right. Calder trophy winner, Tyler Myers. And, uh, NHL All Star Zemgis Gergensens. Never forget. Hey, he he did. He was it was an eight, a nineteen year old defenseman. He put up forty eight points in his rookie year. <laughs> he won the Calder. I, I'm true. entitled to an award uh, from from <laughs> fifteen years ago. Thank you. <laughs> you know, you know, what? I I will give it to you. Absolutely. He's he's our chaos giraffe now. So let, let's give him his his his, uh, his dues. But um, basically, they've been trying a bunch of looks, and those issues have been around for a while. I think. It's a lot about what Tockett's philosophy as well is they need to just simplify their game, right? Get more shots on net. Sometimes they look for the perfect thing and it doesn't work. Or sometimes they just, when they get the shot, they just miss wide. Um, and they've also been giving up some chances shorthanded as well, which is not great. You guys do have um, the fifth most shot attempts on the power play this season. However, it's only ninth hmm. most in shots for. So clearly yeah. you guys aren't hitting the target when you are taking those shots. So maybe you guys are shooting into clogged lanes. Maybe you're missing the net. Again, I have not watched every all 321 minutes of power play time from the Canucks this year. So I can't say for certain. <laughs> um, I would say more of the letter, I think. Okay. Just, just, just trying to be yeah. too fine. Nip that corner rather than yeah, just get yeah. it on. Like those cross crease one tees. I know Tate Thompson's guilty of it too. I mean, and because they can, why not? Right, but I don't know mm-hmm. who your guys on the on the one timer spots are, or even if you guys run a one three one. But um, yeah. trying to be too fine on the one T, I'm like you're the goalie's got to push over, and you're shooting ninety five plus, maybe. Uh-huh. Um, like he's probably not going to get there, even if you put it mostly middle of the net. Like you don't have to be that fine with it. So, and, and again, a lot of your guys' chances have also come off of rebounds and getting in front of the knees in front of the net in the crease um yeah. and, and and you know maybe the, those rebounds just get those shots on don't be too fine i think we saw it in the boston game right the heronic goal is from the point because there's traffic um the besser goal in overtime was a tip in front of the net um first goal again as well besser out front like the dirty areas is where we have to do and i think talk talked about in his interview he kind of wants like I don't remember his exact terminology, but essentially it's levels of traffic, right? It's nice to have one or two guys out in front of the net, 
but you want layers of traffic. You want traffic driving towards the net as well, right? Because that's how you get the rebounds. That's how you draw away defenders. That's how you get other teams scrambling. Um, you got to and... impact the goalie's ability to make a clean save too. Goalies in, in the NHL yeah. are really good. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but but you know, given a clean look at a wrister, they're probably going to steer into a good position and an advantageous position for their team too. So impacting their mm -hmm. ability to make a clean, controlled rebound save is 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 huge. Or another reason for that you want to get a bunch of traffic in front. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's it's one of the things that that the Sabers don't do, right? Obviously, I know mm -hmm. what the Sabers do, and then I look at the stats and like, oh boy, I wonder why we're at opposite ends of the standings. Um, the Canucks <laughs> power play generates the third most high danger chances for in the NHL mm -hmm. this season. Uh, the Sabers generate the fewest high danger chances for in the NHL on the power play. So it just goes to show that like I think the Sabers are over reliant on the one T. Maybe Vancouver's yeah. gotten there and, you know, by talking saying to simplify it, it's like, hey, just get back to what we do, uh, get to the gritty areas and, and go to work, right? Bring your lunch pail. Uh, you guys have 159 yeah. uh, high danger chances for. We have 78. So you guys have double the amount of high danger chances and high danger chances are good chances to have. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think to kind of summarize what we've talked about, right? Yes, the Canucks went through a rough patch and yes, their power play is struggling. But I think this is the time for them to struggle with both those things because they can try and get players to address those needs as well as they have time kind of with Lindholm coming in early to like find the right fit for him, right? I think Talk gets toyed with having the crazy four, uh, four piece uh, down the middle of Miller, PD, Lindholm, Bluger, which is just a ridiculous center core. Elias Lindholm as your third line center is like... That's some NHL stuff. You traded away all five of your first round picks so you could get Miller, Pedersen, Lindholm, Bluger down the middle. Um, that, that like this is just filthy. So whether well, they do that, I also I'm also like I'd like them not to do that just so they can keep their third line together uh, when Dakota Joshua comes back. And that's someone I think uh, that's earned some money this year with his injury. Funny enough, because with his presence, you, we've seen in the with the Wild game how bad the Canucks penalty kill was that game. And Dakota Joshua is a crucial part of that. And that third line that was just brilliant. Um, while Garland still be doing doing his thing, I think it's just that much more effective with Garland, Joshua, and Bluger all together being more than a sum of their parts. Although to be fair, Garland is just having a ridiculous season. I've always been a big Connor Garland guy, but the good thing is, like you mentioned, there's time. If you're gonna struggle, better to struggle in mid February than mid April. <laughs> Absolutely. For uh, sure. 22 games remaining. You guys will figure it out. I'm sure the, and the big thing is again, like we've said, five on five is really where your bread is buttered, um, especially in the playoffs. <laughs> so a good goalie, good five on five, just get the power play hot at the right time. And, you know, look out, right. Who knows what's going to happen. Um, speaking of 22 games remaining, the Sabres have finally put together <laughs> a three game winning streak for the first time. This season, they have won more than two in a row. Um, they also, uh, we have a goal, right? Uh, Chad De De uh, De Dominicis, I believe is how you pronounce his name. Uh, he's an advanced analytics guy. He's a Buffalo local guy, right? Um, so our goal is 39 points over the last, I think what it is, 20. Uh, yeah, it was like 24, something like that. Anyway, our goal is 39 points. We've acquired four. We need 35 mm. of the next 48 points to hit his Ooh. target to make the playoffs. Could it happen? You know, you, know, huh, you know what? I was saying oof, but honestly, honestly, that doesn't, like, I'm, I'm looking at your schedule, and oh my god, it's a nightmare. But, or at least the first part is, it looks a little, eh. So I'm looking at your schedule here. You guys got, so just the, next week, you got the Panthers, uh, Lightning, Golden Knights, Jets, Leafs. Like, that's a <laughs> nightmare stretch. They probably got to go what three one and one in that stretch to 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 maintain a good enough pace. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. Out of that, out of that ten points, we would need to get seven, right? I, I'll be honest. Maybe I'm looking at this wrong. I only see two opponents you guys have left under five hundred. Um, the Kraken and the Senators, because I think the Capitals are above five hundred. If I'm not wrong, depending on how Nashville does, but they're pretty good. Um, they, no, they're, they're not going to get close. I just know that they, they may falter down the stretch, um, is what I'm thinking about the Preds, but yeah. 
Yeah, no, it's uh. Yeah. It, oh my god. If we make it, we go earn it, buddy. Um, yeah. <laughs> if you guys make it, you're actually a threat in the playoffs because you are in your 22 games. You have two. Count them. Two opponents under 500. Yeah, that is an absolutely brutal schedule. My God. Well, I don't think I, I do think the Sabers. Listen, last week. <laughs> Compared to this week, we're talking, oh, do they have a chance? Can they do it? And I'm like, well, I think they might be able to. It's a complete 180, right? But I don't know. If, mm-hmm. I, I did I did text you earlier in the morning to say, like, if you get a chance at all today is watch the highlights from the Carolina Hurricanes game. I'm not going to step through the Canadians game or the Blue Jackets game, but I will talk about this Carolina Hurricanes game because this is the first time this season where I've really felt into it. And it feels like, the team matched it, right? The team was up for it. And it feels like for the first time they played the right way. They played hard. They competed at a, at a, at a playoff caliber. Right. And I was like, Oh my God. I mean, I'm sitting there on the couch with my wife. We're actually cheering for a goal. Like, <laughs> like, I, I, like, I'm like, yeah, come on. Oh my God. The, the, the power play uh, where they cleared it a couple times. Oh my God. That was amazing. <laughs> the, the, uh, it was, it was cousins, Greenway Johnson. And I, for, I think it was power. I think it was the four of them um, were out there for a penalty kill. I believe it was in the third period and yeah, third period. they got stuck out there for a minute and 40 seconds, but they were blocking shots. They were getting in the lanes, tipping passes, and they eventually forced enough pressure where Carolina knocked the puck out of their, out of the zone on their own, uh, due to an Aaron pass. And I'm like, yeah, come on boys. And uh, you know, I, I, I shut up for a second and I can hear the arena doing the same thing. So like, it was just so refreshing to do it again. And I don't know why, but I, I bought in like that was all I needed was to see them do that. They are capable of that. Like it, it just proves to me they're capable of going toe to toe with a team like Carolina. Yes. Carolina was on the second day of a back to back. It went to a shootout. Sabres won. I don't care. We got two points for three straight games in a row. That's the first time that's happened to us this season. I was doing the math before the game and I believe there's only two other teams that had that. Um, I believe it was the Columbus Blue Jackets and Chicago Blackhawks. The San Jose Sharks, believe it or not, do have a three-game winning streak this season. They did, and that's when I thought they were good for a while, and then they went on to lose like 10 to 11 straight or some shit like that. Pardon me. Ah, So I I actually pulled the numbers uh, from Matthew Fairburn. Uh, He put it on Mm -hmm. uh, The Athletic. Um, There have been 100 and there were 113 three game winning streaks in the NHL going into Sunday's game against Carolina. That was the Sabres first. 113 other instances. So you guys, I'm sure, have like eight or nine of those. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. And so do a bunch of the other good teams. But it's just been it just speaks to how infuriating the season has been. Uh, But Mm -hmm. all that being said, you take a step back. We have a decent sample size now. We can start to take a look at some of the numbers, and it's not as bad as it feels. It feels terrible. Their shooting percentage, so this is all going to be at five-on-five year-over-year performance. Their shooting percentage has regressed by 0.8%. Um, so they went oh, from wow. 9.4 to 8.6. Um, their shots four per game have dropped by one. Um their save percentage actually increased from a 903 to a 910. Uko Pekalukin, and we'll talk about him in a minute, but um, what a difference. Yeah. Since January, he's been god tier. Um, but here's here's where the interesting numbers lie. And it leads me to be excited about the future of the Sabres. And, you know, I'm feeling this way because of their game against Carolina, showing they can do it against a team that embodied them. They were well, I think they are four eleven and four or four eleven and two or something like that. Uh, against the Hurricanes in the last 17 meetings. So they have mm-hmm. pretty much owned us, and for us to go toe-to-toe like that was exciting. But the exciting numbers here, shots against per game, have decreased by 3.87. So almost four Ooh. fewer shots against per game, which means mm-hmm. instead of toe-to-toe with their opponent, 25 and a half, four, 25.7 against like they were last season, just good luck, everybody, just go score goals. It's now 24 and a half, four to 22 against. So they're now starting to control the shot share. They're also controlling the goals, uh, the goals share as well. Um, this season at five on five, their goals four have regressed by 0.3. So about a quarter fewer goals per game from 2.4 to 2.1, which is tough as a fan having to sit in the building, but 
their goals against have dropped from 2.23 to 2.07. So a regression mm-hmm. of point, uh, or I'm, I'm sorry, that's the wrong category. Their goals against, they were not that good last year. Two and a half goals against per game at five on five. This year, mm-hmm. it's 1.97. Wow. So that's yes. a huge difference. Yes. So the goals for have dropped off a, a little bit. But the goals against have dropped off massively, and the XG tells a similar story. They're still not controlling the XG share, uh, but they're they're getting better. But all of this mm. speaks to the team is regressing in the area, or I should say progressing in the areas we needed them to last year. Last season, the Sabres, everybody, every ESPN game we had down the stretch, and every time I read the Athletic article, and every time I saw a tweet, it was, well, the Sabres are good, but they don't play defense, and the Sabres just bleed goals, and they can't stop, and that's not playoff hockey, and, you know, they might make it just because they've got a ridiculous offense, but they'll never make, have any, blah, 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 blah. Okay, cut. This season, <laughs> they are playing a very mature game, but the goals just aren't there, and I think that just kind of alludes to our top players dealing with injuries and having a, a step back, the whole team learning how to play this more mature style. So I saw somebody bring up this comment about, you know, everybody but the first line is doing all right. Obviously, we've talked about Paterka ad nauseum on this podcast. We've talked about Benson's great uh, additions. We've even mentioned, uh, you know, Middlestat and Greenway. We've, we've mentioned Cousins' struggles too, but I think the one that highlights the biggest difference for me is the Thompson Tuck Skinner line. Yeah. Thompson Tuck and Skinner combined for 118 goals last year. And it, quite nice. And the amount of games they played, they averaged one and a half goals for per game as as a threesome. This season through so they've all played about 50, right? 48 for Tage, 51 for Tuck, 50 for Skinner, which I think also, you know, plays into it, right? They've missed time due to injury. They've yeah. only scored 51. That is a combined 1.03 for per game, right? Yeah. So that's, that's half, half a goal down. Half a goal for your top line. And those are the guys that you need, right? I still think they have it in them. And as they get healthier, right, they could. Uh, but the, the biggest culprit is Thompson, right? He scored 47 and 78 last year. That's good enough for 0.6 goals per game. This season, he has 16 in 48, which is 0.33 goals per four per game. Tuck has dropped mm-hmm. from 0.4. Four nine to point three one, and Skinner's gone from point four four to point three eight. So his his drop off is the least significant of them, and I think that's also because Tuck yeah. and Thompson aren't doing as well, which means Skinner isn't going to do as well either. They feed off each other, but you know, rising Skinner's, tide kind of thing, but the yeah. opposite. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. When Tage is scoring and shooting, maybe Skinner's there for the rebound, or they pay extra attention to Tage and you know all that kind of stuff. So uh, yeah. I don't think teams pay extra attention to Jeff Skinner like they would a Tucker or a Thompson, though. So it's just of the course. style no, no. he plays. But but I, I say all of these numbers and we talk about all of this to say I don't think it's as bad as it feels. Now the compete level has not been there from the jump. Uh, there there has not been, there's been games where they've 75 percent skated. I think Anaheim was a big example of yep. that where they made mistakes and they didn't really rebound from it. But I think I think all in all, they are playing a more mature style of hockey. And I, I you know, I, I'm going to see this last. I think it's what is it? 24 games remaining for the Sabres in this last 24. Listen, I don't care if they make it at this point. I just want to see them get close. I want to show me that they can play this style of hockey with success. And so far, so good. Since January, the Sabres um, have not lost more than two in a row. In fact, the Sabres have not lost more than two in a row since December 5th was the last time they lost three or more in, in succession. Now, yeah, if you want to talk about, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, say on the flip side, the wins first three game winning streak hasn't helped, right? You may, you may lose two or fewer, but you're not winning more than two or one. That's what kills yeah. you. So. Yeah. I was going to say, actually, um, this is more of a positive for you guys. I know this is providing a positive stat for the Sabres um, regarding their more mature game. I, I don't think that's an all year thing. I think that's more of in the new year. Um, and I'll, cause I'll give you a perfect example in December alone, the Sabres gave up five or more goals, five times. Since January 1st, they have given up five or more goals once. That's a massive difference. And I think a lot of that has to do with what you're talking about, how they're reducing the shot attempts against. But it also has to do with that uh, 0.07 uh, increase to save percentage as well. Uko Pekalukanen has been unreal, as you said. Um, But 
as we've seen from the Canucks, you really depth helps. Yes, absolutely. And I think the Sabres have depth. But the two things that or I guess it's one thing now before the Sabres were missing goaltending. Now you're getting that from Uko Pekalukan. And the one thing that you, for any team, you'll, you know, you look at the top of the league, you see the Jets, you see the Stars, you see the Golden Knights, you see the Bruins, the Panthers, the Rangers. The one thing that they all have in common is that their stars are playing. They're all playing well, or at least most of them are playing well. Even the Hurricanes, right? They were down for a while, but Ajo turned it on, and now all of a sudden they're second in their division. If your stars are producing, they are the people that drive the boat. The point of depth is to help you in the playoffs. When the matchups are tight and when it's grit and grind, depth is there to help you get a little higher in the standings, but mostly for the playoffs. Ultimately, getting to the playoffs and regular season success will always be based on goaltending and on your star players playing. So this season for the Sabres really reminds me of the second half of the Canucks season last year. How did you know I was just pulling that up on my screen? Like, I literally have the actual <laughs> stats pulled up right here. Holy cow. That's amazing. We, we, this podcast is – we were already just kind of in sync, but I think this podcast is helping as well. Um, but uh, it's it's kind of – they're developing the structure. Same way with Talkit, right? The Canucks were kind of developing the structure last year. And uh, hearing – I know there will be some Sabres fans, and especially some fans who are not fans of the Sabres, hearing you say, like, oh, I just want to see them get close and be like, whoa, so you don't want a better draft pick? You don't want a better prospect? But that's – and yes, that's a valid point, but that's not what it's about, right? It's about creating structure, about creating culture, about creating good habits that can then carry into next year because you're likely going to bring this core back again. You're not going to be losing anybody. Majority uh, of it, major. Yeah. yeah. So if they have the right habits instilled, if they have the chemistry built up together, if they have the right mentality, they have the ability to make noise because make no mistake, the Sabres team record might not be amazing, but it is a very talented team. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that entirely. And, you know, people say, why why don't you want to just bottom out and whatnot? It's like, we've done that. We have the prospects. Our pipeline is probably still what, like the best in the NHL, if not top five, right? Like <laughs> Macklin Celebrini, I, would, I, I know I said I'd trade the first overall pick. I would keep it because, you know, he's really <laughs> good. Um, that yeah. was just me after <laughs> talking after a loss, right? Um, <laughs> but no, I like, we... I, the pipeline is already there. We have a log jam of good forwards coming up. Like Yuri Kulik uh, leading to Czechia to, to a bronze medal in the world juniors, right? Noah Oslin, mm. part of silver, silver medal, S Sweden, um, yeah. you know, and, and not to mention some other players that I, I'm sure I'm forgetting Isaac Roseanne uh, and more, right? Matthew Savoy. Yeah. I just, I keep naming these prospects. These are top so 15 picks and they're all looking yeah. pretty good in their respective leagues. So it just makes you wonder where is everybody going to go? But like you mentioned that second half of the season for the Canucks and I, I, I will disagree with your point that it's just after the new year. I think we're seeing the rewards after the new year, but they've been playing this way all season. And I think they've, it's finally clicked. It's settled in. Okay. I think they're finally understanding what they need to do. And after injuries, mm -hmm. oh my God, December was brutal. December, I mean, Thompson, mm -hmm. that's when Thompson, Tuck, and Skinner were all missing time um, mm -hmm. this season. Everybody was missing in December besides Middlestat and Paterka, it felt like. Um, yeah. Greenway was out e e then too. You know, it was just like, oh, you could never get a the actual lineup together. Even Zemgus Gergensen's was out. And that does make a difference, you know, because then you're Her calling up... Star. Yeah, well, I mean, you're calling up youngsters to play a fourth line role, and it's like we don't really want to do that. Where does Brett Murray fit in? Like Brett Murray cannot <sighs> skate at an NHL level. Um, there's a bunch of fans that want to give him a chance. I just don't think he's got the he's got the legs for it. But, but the Vancouver okay. Canucks after Tockett came in, Tockett came in at game 47. They went mm -hmm. 20, 12, and four in that stretch. Mm -hmm. The Sabers obviously have only played 11 of those games, but they are or 12 of those games. Sorry. Uh, they are seven and five through game 58. The Vancouver Canucks were five, five and two under the Tocket mm -hmm. era. So uh, again, like a 20, 12 and four stretch, I don't think would get us to the point mark we need. Uh, what is that? That's 44 points. I don't think 44 yep. points from then on. Right. So, so from game 59 to the end of the season, you guys actually did go 15, seven and two. Um, 15, seven and two. We mentioned, what did they need? They needed, would 15, 46. seven and two get them 35? I think it was. Yes, it's 35. That would be one, one again. But, but 
but it would be encouraging, right? I wouldn't, I would, I would love that if they just went on this 15, seven and two run finished one. I mean, at that point, right. We're just projecting that we're going to need 95 or something like that. Um, so we don't even know what it would actually take. Um, yeah, but just to go on that run and, and be in that conversation and to know that, okay, we've figured out how to play hockey at a, at an, at, you know, a great level, and Thompson's going to recover from the hand injury. Tuck's going to recover from the hamstring injury. Skinner's going to recover from whatever injury he's got. He's now re-injured again. So, of course, as I'm saying this, it happens again. It's a, it's just an awful season. Just the whole season's a nightmare. We are going to get a new Jumbotron, though, which is very exciting. Ooh. Very, very, very happy very about fun. that one. And a new roof yes. because our ceiling is going to be so much higher. Um, sorry, mm. I had to. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's a good one. Maybe that's the whole problem all along is we just didn't set the bar high enough. So we just need a taller ceiling. No, no, it was the Jumbotron. The, the, the players with the Jumbotron, like, ah, this is kind of mid. Let's just play like our Jumbotron. When Dude. they get the new one, they'll play like their Jumbotron. To be fair, the Canucks made a Jumbotron uh, upgrade this year as well. So maybe that's the secret. That is the secret. Look at that. Wait, who cares about mm -hmm. schemes and players? It's about the Jumbotron. Um, Duh. No, but like entertainment the, value. The Jumbotron is so glitchy, like going there, like some. I, I'll, you, you watch the Jumbotron and it literally like buffers it like it like stutters and there's like on one of them there's like a square missing or like a black line through it it's just it's brutal it's it's time That's terrible the in arena experience has been awful and, and the team isn't helping so when we boo we're just very unhappy with everything um but hey We'll see. I mean, uh, Benson's been amazing. Uh, Uko Pekalugan has been amazing. Paterka's been amazing. Oh, one guy I did want to get to. It would be a disservice of me to get to our trade, our mock trade section, if I didn't bring him up and his recent performances. Peyton Krebs has finally been unshackled from the anchors of Zemgus Gergensen's and Kyle Oposo. <laughs> He's finally been let free from Alcatraz. He is free. Um, <laughs> the man has done his time. He is now playing on a line with Zach Benson and JJ Paterka, and the Carolina Hurricanes game was their fifth game. We won three in a row after those guys got a little bit of chemistry together. Coincidence? I think not. Um, and the stats mm. would back me up on that. The Sabres have 61% of the shot attempts with that line on the ice. They have 62% of the goals scored when that line is on the ice and they have 66% of the high danger chances when that line is on the ice. And all of this is at five on five. So Krebs, Paterka Benson is a great line. It works. And Krebs, you know, I know Krebs has been a name floated in trade talks, which is why I bring, I'm bringing him up before we get to that section of the episode. I just, I, I, I don't know. I've always thought there was that goal he scored, uh, uh, excuse me, assist he had against Boston. It was like one of his first games here, like within like a week of being here, he made this sick pass back to Tuck. And I was like, oh my God, the Eichel trade is amazing. We did so <laughs> well for once. Um, you know, Eichel won the cup, but I don't really care about that. I care about the Sabres and potentially making the playoffs. And hopefully Tuck and Krebs are the pieces for that because Jack Eichel was not. But um, no. <laughs> but yeah, it was one of those. And then all of a sudden, yes, he needed to work on his game, but then he got stuck with Kyle Oposo and Zemgus Gergens, I think for way too long. He played way yeah. too many minutes with those guys. And yes, I know he had to learn how to play a defensive game. And that defensive fourth line was one of the reasons why the Sabres were so good last year. But I think Krebs earned it, right? We want to talk about guys earning a spot and playing in the right way in the culture. And I think Krebs did overdue, right? Probably about two months overdue to move him up the lineup for an extended look. Um, but I'm glad Absolutely. he's finally getting it, and I'm glad that he's making the most of it. That pass to power, um, I don't know if you watched the highlights or not, but that pass to power last mm -hmm. night was so nice, so patient. Zach Benson, Zach Benson makes that play, by the way. By actually yeah, crashing absolutely. the net, he attracts the attention of three defenders, and then Krebs passes it to a wide open Owen Power in the slot, and he's just a great shot. Not a very hard shot, just put in the right spot. It's almost like someone at this podcast kept telling the Sabres to go through the net and play in front of the net. It's, it's amazing that it took an 18-year-old. It is it was me? Or maybe it was, I think it was someone else. I, I think it was us. Uh, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll let you share the credit. <laughs> Your face is also on the thumbnail. So, <laughs> Yay. But, but with that, we are actually going to talk about some potential trades. We, we've teased some trade ideas and some trade talk as we've gone on the podcast, but we have actual trade options now. For us and some teams that we might be wanting to keep an eye on some of the hot names in the league. So without further ado, 
Let's get Elias Pettersson out of Vancouver. Oh my God. No, 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 Ryan. No, don't you leave PD right there. All right. He's going to sign his 12 by eight and then he's going to eat sushi every day and, and, and run the grouse grind. All right. Uh, all right. Um, however, if, <laughs> if, uh, Rutherford and I forgot your GM's name, Al Alvin, Alvin. Alvin yes. yes. Oh, I had it. I nailed it. I just didn't trust myself. Uh, if, if <laughs> Rutherford and Alvin disagree with you and disagree with Elias Pettersson that he's not worth 12 million, would you take this return from the Anaheim Ducks? So out goes uh, Elias Pettersson and a second. And in... We're giving up a pick with Pettersson. This is already horrible. Coming in comes Troy Terry, Isaac Lundstrom, Tristan Lunau, a second round pick, and then next year's first. Okay, so we're going to trade for Connor McDavid. We'll give you Connor Garland, Teddy Bluger, uh, Elias Pettersson, the defenseman, and a third round pick. That, that's my response to that. That is that is bits and pieces of the Ducks with one good player. You can piss right off. Yeah. I, I would if, if I heard that, I wouldn't pick up the Ducks phone for about three weeks. That is a joke. I think I, I mean, hey, if they're going to make a bad trade that way, you may want to answer because they make a bad trade the other way. So you might as well answer over those three weeks. So, um, no, I agree with you. I think <laughs> I think you're giving up the best player in this deal. Now, I think Troy Terry is being slept on. Your whole team is like second liners that are amazing, and then some first liners thrown in there like Petey. Um, you know, but but I I just I just don't see it with this trade. Yes, you'll shed some cap and you'll have some room to maneuver next year. But I don't know. I'm a big Troy Terry guy. I don't think it's enough to make this deal go through. The first round pick next year from the Ducks. Could be the first overall pick. Does Elias Pettersson improve them that much? We'll see. But I don't think it's going to happen. I would also yeah. veto this trade. But it was just something I wanted to throw out there. You know, we're talking about PD. Right? Why don't Why don't we make things interesting? Spice it up here. <laughs> all right, all right. Um, let, me, let me throw you the worst of my three trades then as well. Um, <laughs> we, we have, uh, so Calgary and Tampa Bay. Um, Calgary, uh, we all know t Calgary has a ton of players, uh, on the trade block. So oh I, I have two Calgary trades here. We'll start with this one. It's a Hannafin to Tampa Bay. Uh, what Tampa I Bay would be. hate it already. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, Tampa Bay would be giving up to the flames would be Emil Martinson, Lilliberg, uh, Ethan Gauthier, Isaac Howard, and a conditional 2025 second round pick that becomes a 2026 first round pick if Hannafin resigns because Tampa just has no first round picks until then. Um, Jeez. let's, let's hear your thoughts. I, I, I certainly have some thoughts on this as well. Um, just for clarity before that, uh, Isaac Howard is the Tampa Bay's top prospect. Uh, yeah, I think that's as you put it earlier, much. their only prospect. Yeah. Um, but yeah, let's, let's hear your thoughts. Uh, my thoughts are, I think, I think they're going to get way more than that. And I think they can, oh, mm -hmm. maybe not more, but I think they can get better quality, right? Call Buffalo. Absolutely. Buffalo can just trounce that <laughs> with two prospects in a second. Done. Here. Mm -hmm. Take Savoy uh, and 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 take uh, take Kulik. Done, and Done. we'll give you a second. Like, I don't, I, I don't know if that would actually go through if Calgary would accept that, but I certainly think that's a better trade offer than than whatever the heck Tampa base. Oh, here we promise to give you a first round pick if the league still hasn't dissolved in the year twenty seventy two because that's our next first round pick. Like that? Why am I trading? Like they, <laughs> Calgary's not. I, I I I just. I guess Calgary would take the approach of quantity over quality, which is what they did with the Lindholm trade, right? If you yeah. have enough dart throws, maybe one of them will pan out. But I don't think that's how development works. That's just me. I'm sitting here on a podcast, not up in a front office. So, I don't know. I think I think quality is what Calgary needs. I think they need to get some guys. I agree. I, need, I think they need guys like the Sabres offer, right? I, maybe that's just, just yeah. me just saying I want Hannafin. Um, but I think what they need is more of what the Sabres have to offer, which are guys that are one, maybe two years away, maybe could step in now um, yeah. versus prospects that might be a third liner, middle sixer, and then some depth dudes, right? Like, that, yeah. yeah, boo. Next. So to be clear, I think you're saying you're rejecting that deal, yes? Yes. I said boo. Boo. All right. I, I have to agree. Again, Isaac Howard's an intriguing enough prospect, a uh, second round pick side, but they're going to get a much better return for Hannafin. They will get at least a first round pick and at least one B level prospect minimum. Here, if they might get a 2020 uh, pick in 2026, it's a first round pick. They will be getting a 2024 or a 2025 first round pick, which is more valuable as it's more recent and they'll be getting a better prospect than they can offer. And 
not to insult Lilleberg or Gautier, I'm sure they're nice enough people, but that those that that's like an NHL trade. You're just like filling in the trade value bar to try and make them almost equal. This is the sum of these parts is less than the actual value. Like this is this is an easy rejection for me as well. And you got to think that there's going to be better offers on deadline day, Absolutely. right? Like Tampa 100%. may, Tampa may as well. Like, I feel like that's what Tampa would and could and should offer. But yep. if I'm the, if I'm Calgary's GM, I'm probably ha- that's probably sixth on my list of offers, right? If everybody else says, actually, I changed my mind, I'll call you back. But yeah. So, all right. My turn to bring one, and I'm not going to tell you what your return is until the end. The Vancouver Canucks going out. Mm. Ilya Mikheyev, a sixth. Okay. Next year's first and second and fourth. A 2026 first, second, and fourth. Are you even allowed to trade away that many draft picks? What are we freaking the LA Rams? I th- and then the Chicago Blackhawks, huh? Get Ilya Mikheyev, a sixth and then a fourth, as well as Jake Gensel with fifty percent salary retained from Chicago. He then leaves Chicago and goes to Vancouver. Okay, that follows. I was like, what the heck is Jake Gensel going to Chicago? I like Bedard too, but my God. Okay, that makes more sense. So uh, okay, there's okay. some there's some more stuff thrown in here. Like the Pittsburgh Penguins get a bunch of those picks. Uh, they get Ryan Donato and they eventually get Ilya Mikheyev, right? And they, there's some other coincidental stuff that happens here, but I won't, I, I'm not worried about where Ryan Donato and Ian Mikheyev end up. The big one here is all of those picks for Jake Gensel. Okay. There's two approaches to this, because if you make this deal, it's cup or bust this year, and then you're going to lose a lot next year. Um, you're definitely not going to be able to keep Gensel. So this is a heavy, heavy price for a rental. So this is really the Toronto Raptors question, right? When they went all in for Kawhi Leonard, they were not doing that for the sustainability of the franchise. They were championship or bust. If they had lost, they would have ended up in an even worse position than they are now. Um it's the exact same thing here. The Canucks do not have the prospects to fill in the people they're going to lose here if they make this trade. Um, and I understand those are picks and those are going to take a while, but that's capital you can use elsewhere. If you cap retention, whatever. That being said, Jake Gensel is an, is an excellent forward and he just makes that deadly Canucks forward core that much more deadly. Um, Mikheyev is having a pretty piss poor season, so it'd be nice to get his money off the books and replacing him with Jake Gensel is just hilarious because now you put Jake Gensel on that first power play unit. It is Pedersen, Miller, Gensel, Besser, Hughes. And then you have Lindholm and Hronik on that second power play unit. Like the, and the Hoagland are one of the like top 10, pl- top 15 players in five on five goals on the power play too. I'm sure he's just fine on the power play. Um, like it's just, it's just, it's, it's an offensive, like vomit, just vomiting offense and expected goals and high danger chances. I just do not have the stomach to give up that many assets. I just can't do it. I think I, it, I, th- I, th- I think I'm with you there. Sick thinking about it. I-, I feel nauseous right now. I'll be honest. I feel nauseous hearing that because it's like, oh my god, Jake Gensel. But I, the, the like the assets. Oh my god, that could set the franchise back years. If you didn't give up the 2026 first, would you pull the trigger? So that'd be. So by the way, that's that's not that's there's only the only 2024 pick is a sixth. The rest of the picks are a one, two, four, and twenty five. And a one, two, four, and twenty-six. However, if it was one, two, four, two, four, would that make you feel better? Would you do it? <laughs> it then? Definitely would make me feel better. Would you do it then, though? You're getting Gensel at one and a half million on the cap. <laughs> I, you know what. If this if this play like the happiness I would have for the rest of my life for the Canucks won the cup. Sign me up. I'll take it. Deal. <laughs> I think I think it I think it would be tough. Um you guys actually gain uh 3.25 million in cap space in this deal <laughs> because you're getting rid of Mikheyev. 
Um, I don't know your guys resign and I'll do my research. Don't worry guys in the off season, you'll, we'll be talking playoffs, but I will be crunching the numbers for you guys getting contract projections. So that's where I'll come in handy this off season for you guys. You Canucks fans <laughs> want to know what the hell I'll be doing. Will you, uh, will you guys are in the playoffs having fun. It's like the Squidward Plus. watching SpongeBob and Patrick meme. I'll be inside crunching numbers. <laughs> um, as far as guys, you Good have man. to resign Elias Patterson, Elias Lindholm, Teddy Bluger and Sam Lafferty, as well as basically all of your defenders. So the question is, mm -hmm. could you get them plus Gensel at under $52 million on the cap? Ooh, that's a very interesting question. I think you can. I think having Quinn Hughes locked up. Now, the one is Philip Peronik. He's an RFA, yeah. though. So I think there's a way to do it, but then you're going to need your young guys like Lekaramaki, Pod Colson, and the others down there in the minors, even Atu Rati. I don't know how he's been doing, but you know, those are the guys you're going to need to step up as well as finding cheap, um, you know, find more Nils Amans or Nils Hoglanders or Pius Suters, right? For that kind of cap head. You're going to need those guys. If you do this deal, I think, I think it's totally doable. And I think you can actually lock those guys up for another run at it too. Uh, Pedersen. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really Pedersen, Pronik, and Gensel. And nothing says Pedersen, like, stay, like, going out and getting Gensel. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. All right, so, you got, you got actually, one for us? Well, hold on. We, you didn't say whether you take it or not. I, I would take it. I would do it. I would okay. do it because I know you said you don't have the prospects and whatnot, but, like, your, your core is in its prime now. Those prospects aren't going to be here in time to help you. Jake Gensel is Jake freaking Gensel. Like, do it. Yeah, I, I think that's a deal that's potentially good for both sides. So, yeah, interesting, interesting. All right, we'll go to the second Flames deal. Uh, Jacob Markstrom, notable former Canuck, uh, going to the LA Kings for a 2025 fourth-round pick. Arthur Kaliev and Matt Roy. Or, well, I'm not 100% sure. I think it's Roy. Yeah. Um, deal, all right. Deal. Want to explain? <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the Calgary Flames have Dustin Wolf on the horizon and goaltending is obviously one of those things that is not going to be an issue for them. They will sign some veteran. They can heck, sign Martin Jones for 1 million, start him 30 games, right? Calgary's not in need of a quality goaltender right now. I'm sorry, Calgary, right. but you're not, it's going to be one or two years and then you'll need one. And by that point, you've got Dustin Wolf coming up and barring any major setbacks. I think you'll be fine. And you'll round out your roster with some decent talent. Uh, Kaliev and Roy, you know, they could, wah, I don't know how he says it, but, you know, you'll be able to, you know, build out a more uh, fleshed out roster uh, with those guys mm -hmm. than, than Markstrom. And you get that cap hit off the books. I think that's a bit high for what Markstrom is. And I think it's good for K uh, LA Kings too, right? I'm, I'm talking about it from Calgary. I'm doing a Calgary Flames franchise mode on my YouTube channel, right? So I'm in a Calgary <laughs> Flames state of mind here at times too. Uh, I know some of you Vancouver Canucks fans just cringed, but I'm sorry. Um, uh, but but I think the LA Kings, they need a goalie and th I think they do kind of need to save their season. I know they made the change for coaches and I know goaltending maybe isn't the worst thing their, you know, their biggest issue right now. I think Talbot's playing fine and Phoenix Copley. I mean, they're all playing fine, but I think Markstrom, you put a good team in front of him. I think it would be a, certainly an upgrade too. You know, I mean, Cam Talbot's playing really, really well, actually him and Riddich. I mean, I just think Markstrom in there, it's even better. And you might actually have a legitimate chance to make a bit of a run at it too. I don't think Cam Talbot and David Riddich are going to hang on to their form long enough for the LA Kings to either make the playoffs or um, potentially go on a little bit of a run. So yes, I would yeah. do that deal. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to push back on a little bit on Markstrom not being worth the money. I think Markstrom is very good and I think he is worth his money. Um, but I agree that Markstrom is not what the flames need at the moment. Dan Vladar, I think is a solid goalie. And like you said, Dustin Wolf, I think is coming of age where he needs to start playing in the NHL. Kind of how Demko was a backup for a year or two before he ended up becoming the starter by Markstrom. Uh, I think whether it's a veteran goalie or whether it's Dan Vladar, um, Dustin Wolf behind him can be grow sufficiently and they can get some assets for Markstrom. Uh, it's definitely lacking in draft capital, but I think that's okay um, because I, I like Kaliev and uh, Roy as a player, uh, as players, and I think uh, Calgary can aim for more of a retool because I don't think they're planning on trading players like Kadri, who's playing pretty good this year, um, and they have other younger players or kind of middle-aged players. Know. 
yeah, Huberdeau is a perfect example. And I think he's been a little better since Kuzmenko got there. And if they can get that chemistry going, um, that could be a great thing. And if that's the case, then Kaliev and Roy are those players who are a little bit more developed and kind of fit their timeline better. So um, I will also buy on this deal. Awesome. I love the fact that we actually have one that will buy. <laughs> Both of us. <will>. Yes. <laughs> All right, all right. I got another three-team trade for you, and this one involves the Buffalo Sabers. Okay. I don't. I, I I immediately look at this deal and say no. Maybe it's my homerism, but um, mm. the Buffalo Sabers would the judge of that. The Buffalo Sabers would be shipping out Jordan Greenway, and in return would be receiving Tanner Pearson, Christian Dvorak, a second, oh. and a fourth. Whoa. Let me look at Christian Dvorak. He's currently on IR, is what this is telling me. I might say yes to that. Yeah, he's only played 25 games this year. He's got seven points in those 25 games. Hmm. Huh. So, I know, I think you're a little higher on Greenway than I am. I think he's a fine third liner. Um, is that yeah, not Christian also Dvorak what much. Christian Dvorak would be too, though? be okay I, I think he seems to be lacking the last couple of years greenway is definitely the better player um but i think a second and a fourth is more than sufficient uh compensation um i think you can always flip uh pearson and uh <laughs> you can always flip pearson for another pick um so i i would uh if i were the same we don't I didn't deal need with more picks <laughs> we are fine with draft capital. We need wins and goals. Here's here's how I'd argue to that. Just because you're receiving draft capital doesn't mean you have to use it. I'm saying you package that together with whatever else you want and get a different asset. I think you're getting really good pennies on the dollar. Not pennies on the dollar. You're getting you're getting really good like a dollar ten on the dollar for uh for uh Greenway. And I think I don't know. Is he a UFA? Jordan Greenway? Yeah. No, he's locked up for another year at like 3.25. See, that's also a good oh, chunk sorry. of cap. Three, oh, yeah, but Christian Dvorak is also making 4.45. So we'd be adding 1.45 million for the same player to add draft capital that we would then trade. I just, I don't see how this trade makes sense for the Buffalo Sabres. I think Greenway has proven his worth. I think he's making 3 million, which is perfect for the kind of player he is. I don't think Christian Dvorak is an upgrade. He's also hurt. So who knows what's going to happen there? Um, yeah, this is, this was, like I said, this is pretty easy. No, for me, I, not to cut you off, but, but Tanner Pearson yeah, yeah. is Matt. Maybe, maybe it's something what we need, but to replace a Poso and Gergensen's cool. I feel like we can find those guys in the off season, a second and a fourth. Thank you. But I, I don't know. I, I, Maybe we use the second and the fourth then to go flip for another player, but at the same time, we have prospects. I think prospects are more valuable than picks. I think so as well, but I I, I don't know. I, I just think that's good value for uh, Greenway. How, how long is Dvorak signed for? Uh, same term, so through next season. Okay. Um, I, I think I'd still go by. I, I think you can find the assets, use Dvorak, potentially move him for, like, if there's someone else that's kind of you're struggling to get under the cap next year or whatever, um, you can ship him off there. So or let me clarify. So let's say you're trying to get someone who's $7 million and doesn't work for you. You can ship Dvorak back the other way to make the money work. And with him being on a one-year deal, it won't be as big of a deal. You kind of see it in the NBA where they kind of ship off that money to make deals work. Um, and honestly, if Dvorak heals, he can be a more than sufficient player. Um and I'm, that's the one you could, again, an, an asset is an asset is an asset, right? I'm just not excited uh, about a guy who's never played more than 78 games. And by the way, that was seven seasons ago. He's played over, over, he's injured this season. Last season, he played 64. Before that, he played 56. Before that, he played 56. And before that, he played 70. So he's a guy that's never scored more than 18 goals. Uh, he's got, he, his career high is 18 goals, 38 points. Uh, he has not touched that mark uh, in the last three seasons. Now this season he's been hurt. I don't see Dvorak as any kind of value. It feels like a cap dump plus some picks. That's what it feels like. Because you mentioned we ship salary the other way. Greenway, <laughs> do the same thing. It's, I mean, we're taking on one and a half million more for, I think, a worse player. 
Okay. That's More fair. injury prone too. Mm-hmm. I, again, I I just can't get off the maybe again. I think you're higher on Greenway than I am. I'm I I would still buy. Okay. All right. Agree yeah. to disagree. Yes. <laughs> All right. This is the last of my trades involving your Buffalo Sabres. So w- would you like to hear what goes out first or what comes in? Let's go in. We've started with out. You receive the worst of two 2024 second round picks from this team and Scott Lawton. So that would be either. Yes, that's right. That would either be the Philadelphia's second round pick or if certain conditions are met, um, the Blue Jackets second round, pick. probably Philadelphia's. Okay. Um, it's definitely going to be Phillies. You... <laughs> let, let me ask you. <laughs> that's let me not ask even a you, question. What, 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 what do you think you'd have to give up to get Scott Lawton and a second? Well, it depends. I mean, I can make different packages for different teams. What is Philly going to want? I bet I bet we're throwing one of our fourth liners back the other way. So, like, Zemgus Gergensen's to replace Scott Lawton. Mm. Plus, maybe... So, Zemgus Gergensen's... Maybe... Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't also throw in Eric Johnson. I'd probably do Zemgod and a... Mm, Probably I would do Zemgod in a pick. They would probably want a roster player. The only guy that's coming to mind is Krebs, and that's an immediate non-starter for me, considering the stat I just mentioned. So, and besides, it would just make no sense if it was Krebs, though, for for us, because it's just the same type of player back and forth. So, I I hope it's not middle stack. Good God. Um, <laughs> I can't really think of anybody else besides maybe Eric Johnson or Oposo. Or maybe it's Comrie because they need a goal. I don't know. Probably picks. Yep. Uh, it's one player. And it's the one you feared the most, Peyton Krebs. And let me explain this to you from a Philly side. Um, you're giving up Scott Lawton, who has been in trade talks the whole time. And Krebs has actually been one of the players they've been interested in for a long time. Um, and I think Krebs really fits that Flyers mold, that grit and grind kind of player you've been talking about how he's earned it now i can see the your face like you've been sucking on some lemons um lawton and a second round pick a second round pick is a good asset but we just talked about how draft picks aren't necessarily what you covet scott lawton is also a good player probably better defensively than peyton krebs but not quite at that offensive level with that up or as the same level of upside as peyton krebs so value wise you're definitely getting value for peyton krebs it's a matter of if it's the right assets for you. Yeah. Uh, let me take a look at S- Scott Lawton's contract. Um, mm-hmm. Scott Lawton is signed for two more seasons after this one at 3 million, um, which again, good. we mentioned is the Greenway contract. He's another Greenway. I, I actually, I like Scott Lawton for Krebs. I don't like it as much. Peyton Krebs is an RFA. He's probably not going to command as much considering he's got only 11 points in 56 games played. Uh, His career high was 26 last year. We'll see if he gets there now playing on a better line. I like Scott Lawton a lot. If the Sabres can swing a trade for him, sign me up. Like, I am absolutely happy with that. If it's Krebs going back the other way, I don't like it. I mean, I could probably part with it. I just don't see Scott Lawton fitting in as well with Paterka and Benson as Krebs has over the last like month. So or month, five games, Jesus. Uh, I am now, I'm also going to put to your, to the test here, your Lawton versus Krebs. Who's better defensively. I'm taking a look at my handy daddy ramp them charts. Uh, and we shall see, uh, it is Peyton Krebs by a freaking mile. Scott Lawton is an albatross offensively and defensively and has one of the worst shot attempts per 60 in the NHL. He probably, I think, is in like the 87th percentile of bad shot suppression in the NHL. And that's just this season. In that case, so so this is Bo Horvat Jr. here who's fooled everyone into thinking he's good at defense because he could take faceoffs. Yes. Uh, Yeah, over the last three (laughs) seasons, he is in – yeah, he's really bad. He's really bad defensively. Let's see. I'm going to get his his actual. I'll just get you a number just for Scott Lawton here. Uh, Scott Wait. Lawton this season. Do you want this season or three-year range? Let's do a three-year range. Let's not judge off a bad season. Scott Lawton's defensive percentile is four. He is better than 4% of players defensively. Ooh. Peyton, Ouch. Peyton Krebs is better than... 42% of players defensively. 
almost average defensively. Look at him. Now, Krebs does have a 12 on the offensive side of things. Let my computer load real quick. Uh, and Scott Lawton's got a 34, but I think Krebs now playing yeah. with Paterka and Benson is going to see that rise now that he's got talent around him and he's not Gergensen's in a poso. So I, I think, I, I think, you know, we may have just uncovered that Scott Lawton is a, uh, what a Trojan horse. Yes. Yes. The, again, the, I'm going to call it the bow of out effect. If you can take face offs, you can play defense. If you are a thicker man and you can take face offs you immediately become good at defense in the eyes of every 65-plus-year-old white dude. <laughs> I'm going to take that personally. You just called me a 65-year-old white dude because I was fooled by Bo Horvat, and I've been fooled by Scott Lawton again. This, this, Come is, on. The, this is the best advertisement for advanced analytics I think you can make. Yeah, <laughs> and, 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 you know, and you would think that playing on a team like Philadelphia – who preaches blocks and defensive structure and, and playing the game hard in the right way that it would help. That hasn't helped Scott Lawton. And I can see why they're probably eager to ship him out. And somebody is going to take the bite. Uh, and it's going to be one of those uh, fool's gold things, right? He's an off, more offensive minded player, more offensive minded two way player, but he's really bad at defense, like really bad. So I'm saying no. All right. Uh, that's fair. Now, I don't want to sound like I'm contradicting myself because I do think Lawton in a second is decent value. But, and I, and I think at the beginning of this podcast, I probably would have taken that deal. But having listened to you talk about the potential of Krebs throughout this, uh, this, through the Sabre segment and uh, kind of talking about how bad Lawton is in this segment, I think I too will have to hit the big uh, no button. No deal. Yeah. I, I think I, you know, the more and more I dive into Scott Lawton, he's like a, Middle six player who's in the second percentile overall, which is bad. Mm -hmm. That's not where you yeah. want to be. Now, maybe the Sabres no. stick him on the third, fourth line, and he improves with less competition, blah, 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 blah. But nothing to me screams like he's the kind of player I want to give up 23-year-old uh, Peyton Krebs for for a 30-year-old Scott Lawton on a more expensive contract for two years. I don't know. Not it for me. So I got yeah. one final one for you, Vancouver fans. I know it's long. Stick with us here. Let's get this player out of a specific team. Would you like right. the ins or outs? Give me the outs. Out is everybody's favorite, Ilya Mikheyev. <laughs> Jonathan Lakaramaki. Ooh. Elias Pettersson. The defense. And two first-round picks. Okay, why are you? Why are you, why are you <laughs> we better be gutting a freaking like a casino or something, like twenty million dollars worth of land for this or something. Yeah, yeah. I, I had you there. I was those three players. You're like, okay, we're getting like a second line, third line player, maybe a defenseman back, and then I dropped two first round picks on your head. Um, you would then get Clayton Keller. Uh, yeah. I gotta look at Keller's contract. Personally, this is the deal I'm doing for Jake Gensel. This is the one I'm smashing for Jake Gensel. Would you? Uh, that's just my look at it, and it depends on how you view Clayton Keller versus Jake Gensel. To me, that's that's really what I'm looking at. So there's a kind of a couple things here. Uh, Clayton Keller has a no trade clause kicking in in 2024. 7.15 is a good price for what's probably a first line caliber forward. Um, so there's no salary retained, right? No, no, sir. 7.1 million. <laughs> Tell you what, I would, this is an option we haven't done yet. I would counter. I would like $1.15 million retained. I'd like a $6 million Clayton Keller, please. Can I have a second? You can have a third. Then I'm only retaining one. <sighs> you son of a female dog. I'm in. <laughs> I personally would do the <laughs> trade straight up. Clayton Keller over the last three years is in the 87th percentile overall and in the 87th percentile among all forwards for offense. 
I think Clayton Keller also has more opportunities in Arizona. He's the focal point of the offense, whereas when he comes to Vancouver, he's not going to be the focal point. He'll be behind Patterson. He'll be behind Miller, maybe behind Besser. Yeah, but we uh, mentioned this earlier, rising tides, right? Do you not think Clayton Keller would benefit from having actual top six line mates for once? Like, are we hey, just... <laughs> Are we just Don't seeing sleep on Nick Schmaltz? All right. Don't sleep on Nick Schmaltz. He's a good player. Yeah. I, okay. Okay. <laughs> but you, know, you throw him on a line with Petey and Besser. Like that sounds very nice. Like gross. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I personally would absolutely, I, I would do that deal. I think if, if the Gensel thing that felt like a lot, this one feels very, very reasonable. He's 25. He's in his prime. You got him locked up for three more years at seven, or is it three more years? I think it is three more years, right? Or two more. Um, either, uh, either way, he's got more, four more years, four more years, four more years. Four more years. Oh my God. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think it's an absolute no brainer. He's entering his prime. He's 25. He fits with the core. You don't have to worry about re-signing him, which might take the sting away from a, a Pedersen leaving. Right. Um, he mm-hmm. no longer is that fourth option. Then he moves up. So there. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I don't know. I think this is a trade that helps you now, and you guys be loaded going going forward. Yeah, no. Clay, Clayton Keller is a good player for sure, as you said. Um, he's a good playmaker, and he can score goals as well. Um, he'll help out the power play, and I think he's a reason. It's a reasonable price for him. Obviously, again, the no con- no trade uh, clause is a little scary, but. Um, most good players are going to come with something like that, some sort of trade protection. Um, and again, assuming he's willing to come to Vancouver, uh, going from that nice, warm Arizona weather to rainy Vancouver, um, I, th- I, th- I think I'd rather him than Gensel. Yeah, I think I think the price... Ooh, that's interesting, because Gensel's a scary one. I, I will admit, we can talk about this off-air, but Gensel's a scary one, just set down to the fact that he's always played with Crosby. Is he a product of Crosby? Is he is he able to play away from Crosby and be as successful? That's my concern with Jake Gensel, right? Um, he probably can. He passes the eye test yeah. for sure. But it's just one of those you never know because we've never seen it. So I think Clayton Keller has never had help. Like, yes, you could throw him on your third line. I mean, I guess I can't say he's never had help like Connor Garland because they were teammates. But, yeah. <laughs> you know, like even even then, like we've seen those two guys have chemistry and that's your third line. Like you're not bringing Clayton Keller to play on your third. I think it's a smash. No, I think it makes sense. I mean, you give I, up uh, two good prospects and two firsts. That's tough. But I will take yeah. a 25 year old Clayton Keller over a first round pick any day because that first round pick could be a 25 year old Clayton Keller someday. You never know. Here's my big thing, right? And I think this is why I favor Clayton Keller, aside from the fact that, like you said, Clayton Keller hasn't quite had the help that uh, Gensel has. Uh, that's me putting it mildly, of course. Um, Clayton Keller is cost-controlled for four years after this. Yes, the no-trade clause is not ideal, but a cost-controlled asset in a top six at 7.15 who could potentially go put up point per game with better players. Like right now, he's putting up 52 and 57, 86 and 82, 63 and 67 over the last three years. He's going to play better with better players, and I'm sure he'll get more points with Vancouver. You're basically picking up another JT Miller-style contract for four years. And again, JT Miller is driving the play on the Canucks. You get another contract like that, that kind of value, that's enough to sustain your team for a long time. So, Because the thing with Gensel is he's going to be demanding eight, nine million dollars in the free agency. Maybe more. Uh, maybe more and who knows if he even wants to stay in Vancouver, right? If, if Keller comes here, he doesn't have a choice. Like maybe he can sit out or something. Right. But generally speaking, he's cost controlled and he's going to be here for four years, unless we trade him any waves, there's no move in which case we'll get even more assets in return with Gensel. You can trade all those assets. And that's why I was so queasy about it is that you could give up all that lose in the second round and then lose him. And you've just set the franchise back decade we'll lose him nothing. and Pedersen. talk about a true nightmare scenario Pan and you have Patterson. no assets Pan and no players well you got Pan players Patterson. but you know Pan what i'm Patterson. saying Pan yeah. Pan exactly uh, with keller you have this asset guaranteed i find it hard to believe Pan that 
Ram powder, uh, he's getting traded powder, from Arizona, powder, powder, playing powder, in a 4,600 seat powder, arena powder, powder, on powder, an <laughs> average team at best. Ram powder, Ram um, powder, Ram powder. Ram powder, and Ram playing powder, on Arizona powder, for all those years powder, to the powder, best team in the powder, NHL powder, wants me powder, and is going powder, to play me on powder, you know powder, 18 powder, minutes a night. Powder, powder, I think I don't think I'm sitting out. Powder, I don't think powder, rain powder, would depress me powder, as much powder, as powder, losing <laughs> for so many years. Ram powder, Ram powder. Th- that's fair. You know, different people to each their own, right? Goudreau chose to go to Columbus. You know, some some people have areas they prefer more than others, but um. It's an interesting thought. I, I, I think you've sold me. Clayton Keller would be an amazing addition to the Canucks, and I think I'd be willing to pay the heavy price. I'm just going to wait for it Man to powder. happen. I Man can't powder. wait to see it Man happen powder. in two weeks, and we can talk Man about powder. it then. <laughs> <laughs> but, Absolutely. Looking forward to it. But that is all the time we have for Man this powder. one. I know Man we took powder. up a lot of Man your time, so Man we powder. thank you Man for powder. listening Man to Man us powder. and indulging Man us Man in powder. another week of Sabres and Canucks talk. And again, we ask you to please like the video if you're watching here on YouTube at RyeBreadSN if those of you want to watch it in video form. Those of you that are taking us on the go on your podcasting app, please leave a a, a, a five-star review and share it with your friends. It does help us out a lot. So thank you guys so much for watching and listening, and we will see you guys in the next one.